The Apprentice and the Armstrongs, essential viewing on Wednesday nights from 9 on BBC Two Scotland. Right now, though, Carl McDougall reveals how history dealt a series of near-fatal blows to the Scots language. Scots was once the language of the royal court, the law, and the vehicle for some of the greatest poetry of the Middle Ages. Yet, by the 20th century, the Scottish National Dictionary was describing Glaswegian speech as hopelessly corrupt, and generations of schoolchildren were shamed or belted for using their mother tongue. This is the story of how the language of kings became the language of the gutter. Speaking your own voice. Right enough. My language is disgraceful. My ma tell me. My teacher tell me. The doctor tell me. The priest tell me. My boss tell me. My landlady in Carrington Street tell me. The fact is, nobody forced us to give up Scots. Instead, we neglected and betrayed the language. A powerful series of events conspired to put Scots into the gutter, and we stood by and watched it happen. Significantly, religion plays a major part in this story. During the bloody reformation of the 16th century, Protestant reformers were locked in a deadly struggle with the Catholic Church. The turbulent preacher John Knox was at the forefront of this revolution. His leadership had an impact on the language. There is no doubt that the reformation increased the move towards anglicisation in Scots. Many of the significant ref Scots reformers, particularly John Knox, had spent time in England and this manifested itself in their own writings in a degree of anglicisation. Also, of course, they had fellow feelings towards English Protestantism. Well, one of the effects of the Reformation in the Scots language is that the reformers are using a kind of international lingua franca. Latin is a lingua franca of the Catholic Church, so you can't use that. So they begin to use a, a Scots that is a little bit more international in its flavour, and that means using an anglicised Scots. Language became a key element during the Reformation. Words spoken in worship defined a relationship with the Almighty. At the heart of the Reformation lay a revolutionary idea. Each one of us could have direct communication with God. Rather than letting priests do the talking for us, we could do it for ourselves. But to achieve this, we needed Bibles we could understand, not the Latin Bible of the Roman Church, but ones written in the language of the people. Good news for Scots, you'd have thought, but there were other ideas. For Protestant reformers, liberating the word of God depended on the new wonder technology of printing. But we lag behind the rest of Europe. The new Protestant Bible was published in Geneva and printed in English. The fact that there is no Bible in Scots during the Reformation period is vital to the development of Scots. The Bible was one of the few books that everybody in Scotland after the Reformation of any consequence whatever had to own, had to possess. So if you read and you're an ordinary person, you read the Bible. So the fact that you're reading the Bible is English becomes uh, the language of the written word. People learn to read in English. They may still be speaking Scots, but they're reading in English. Because there were no Bibles in Scots, English became the language of God. It also became the language of literacy, but it could have been so different. The Lord is my herd, nae want so for me. He louts me to lie among green hows. He hurts me a tour by the lone waters. He walkens my way gain so. He wises me run for his ain name's sake into rich roddens. Na, though I gang through the deep murk dale, e'en there shall I dread nae scathen, for your cell are near by me. Your stalk and your stye hod me baith foo cheery. 
It sounds fantastic, this muscular, rich, potent voice of God, as congregations might have heard it for the past 450 years. But this translation wasn't published till the end of the 19th century, by which time we'd all get used to God answering our prayers in English. One of the interesting things about the language of the Reformers was that it was very, very plain. The Catholic writers of the late 16th century were writing this amazingly kind of stylized Baroque Scots, and the Reformers moved away from that almost as a stylistic choice. They wanted a plain, anglicized medium that everybody could understand. The religious strife that swept Europe during the Reformation not only had an impact on our language, it also brought to an end the Old Alliance, Scotland's 300-year pact with Catholic France. A major effect of it was that it resulted in a political reorientation because Scotland and England were two small Protestant countries more or less isolated against mighty Catholic France and Spain of necessity, Scotland and England drew closer together. In Reformation Scotland, Catholics were the new enemy and Protestants are new friends, which meant, of course, we had to jump into bed with the old enemy, England. Over the next 150 years, this marriage of convenience with our Protestant neighbor would see the Scots' tongue sink even further from grace. Right enough. My language is disgraceful. The lassie I tried to get off with in 1969 tell me. Some wee smout that thought I hadn't read Chomsky tell me. A Calvinistic communist that thought I was revisionist tell me. Although God spoke English in 16th century Scotland, we still had a Scot speaking king on the throne. James VI, the son of Mary Queen of Scots, became our first Protestant monarch in 1579. James reckoned our national church agreeeth as well with a monarch as God and the devil, and told one delegation, Agee not a turd for your preaching. Strong words and spoken in braid Scots. But King James was also a poet and intellectual. James VI is a very considerable writer himself, and from uh, the period of his uh, monarchy in, in Scotland, uh, when he was a young man, he both wrote himself and he encouraged writing and translation into Scots. He writes a style guide uh, called The Rules and Cottles, The Rules and Cautions, uh, for writers of Scottish poetry, telling them how to write Scottish poetry well in Scots. James's celebrated treatise on kingship, Basilicon Doran, which he wrote for his son, reveals the state of our language during his reign. Lo, he and my son, a mirror of you and fair, which showeth the shadow of a worthy king. Lo, here a book, a pattern doth ye bring, which ye should press to follow mare and mare. When James first wrote the Basilican Doron, we have the manuscript of, of that first composition of it. He wrote it in Scots. The fact that he chooses to use Scottish phrases here, like make a bogle of yourself, um, suggests that he was very comfortable with Scots. But clearly, James felt that by the time the book was printed in England in 1603, um, he was conscious that English readers might find fault with or simply not be able to understand some of the choices of Scots words. So that his kingly wisdom could be better understood south of the border, James revised the text in an anglicised edition. In the 1599 edition, James is talking to his son about his relations with God. Speak with all reverence, for if a subject will not speak but reverently to a king, much less should any flesh presume to crack with God as with his companion. So what does the crack become by the time it gets to London? It's it's become the much more prosaic and much less vibrant um, talk. Ah, yeah, of course. Talk with gods. <laughs> what else? One of the things that makes the Basilican Doran so exciting as a work in 15, the 1599 edition is precisely that although it's giving advice and it's talking about serious matters, it will use a choice of phrase that's very distinctively Scottish and very distinctively colloquial, if you like. Our Scots-speaking king was destined for greater things than mere books. 
In 1603, he succeeded the English Queen Elizabeth to become James I of England. So now there was a Scots-speaking monarch on the throne of this new United Kingdom, something that would surely increase the prestige of the language. Things were looking good, except that James upped sticks and took his court to London. It's hard to blame him. He had become king of a much bigger and richer and more powerful country than his own. The King of England was a bigger player in the European scene than the King of Scots could ever be. His intention was never to abandon Scotland. His intention was to promote a union on equal terms between Scotland and England. And he spent much of his reign in England trying to promote this idea, but the, the English wouldn't hear of it. The idea that England and Scotland could be united on equal terms, this was something that was unthinkable. London was not just a powerful political capital. It was at the heart of a cultural renaissance where Shakespeare was its brightest star. Who could resist the allure of Europe's most happening city? In Scotland, there was a brain drain as hundreds followed their king south. The Scottish courtly writers adopt English. Uh, James begins to edit his earlier works, as, as do other writers, other Scottish aristocratic writers. They begin to edit their works and they edit out the Scottish elements. James returned to Scotland only once, when on the broad Scots he'd spoken all his life, he lectured his countrymen on the superiority of English civilization. By the time he died in 1625, Scots had completely lost its status as the language of the royal court, a blow all the crueler for having been delivered by a last Scots-speaking monarch. Right enough. My language is disgraceful. Poofy literati grimly carrying the burden of the future. Tell me. My wife tell me, just to get into this poem, tell me. My wains came in for school and tell me. Long after the Union of Crowns, the Scottish Parliament continued to meet in Edinburgh. Here at least Scots remained the language of power. Almost a century after the last Scots-speaking monarch died, the language suffered another blow, and this time it was almost fatal. The 1707 Treaty of Union banished the Scots Parliament. Henceforth, the voice of government would be pronounced from Westminster in English. The Scots tongue was now powerless. This is where the old Scottish Parliament used to meet and where they passed the Act agreeing to the Articles of Union. On the 1st of May 1707, the bells of St Giles rang a carillion called why should I be so sad on my wedding day? As he heard it, the Lord Chancellor of Scotland remarked, there's an end to an old sign. Scotland in 1707 faced a very difficult situation. Things uh, couldn't go on as they had been going on because the country was visibly getting poorer and weaker. Uh, a decision had to be taken uh, on some new course and there were a number of options open, and the Union was one of them, a plausible and feasible option. The Union offered ambitious Scots huge rewards, but in the scramble for advancement, language was quickly sacrificed. The reasons are pretty clear. English had been established as the voice of God, the voice of the King, and the voice of political power. There was a feeling that Scotland wanted to turn its back on the old, unhappy past. And one of the things that was associated with, so, with this old unhappy past was the language. It gave Scots a sense of inferiority to move into this much richer uh, and more developed society. And this was the origin of the feeling that uh, everything about Scotland was somehow second rate, um, and in particular that the Scots language was a debased and corrupt form of the English language what was being sacrificed was a vivid, live language. And that is the language of the people of Scotland. But when I look back in history to those times, I can't help but have a certain contempt for the Scots that turned in their own language as if they were turning on their own people. Economic boom followed the Act of Union. This new prosperity coincided with an unparalleled intellectual explosion. 
In terms of big brains, no other European city could hold a candle to Edinburgh. The French philosopher Voltaire claimed it is to Scotland that we look for our idea of civilization. The achievements of the Enlightenment did not come without cost. Scots was unceremoniously dumped for the language of progress and prosperity, English. For intellectuals of the time, the choice of English wasn't merely practical. It reflected the ethos of Enlightenment. Enlightenment thought was meant for the whole of mankind, for the whole of the civilized world. It wasn't thinking that its uh, authors in any way conceived as being confined to Scotland. So in that sense, the choice of the English language, the, the language that would allow their books to be sold in London uh, or indeed in Philadelphia, was a, a natural, an inevitable, a necessary choice for them. But the drive of Scottish intellectuals to reach a wider audience became a campaign against the Scots language. They did make a strong attempt to eradicate any trace of Scots in their own writing. And I think this is part of an 18th century movement which is beginning to think of Scots as being vulgar. And they did not want to be thought of as vulgar writers. Hume uh, still speaks Scots, uh, but like many people in his, in his time, he writes in English and he's beginning to become ashamed of the Scots that he speaks. People compiled lists of Scots words, Scots idioms, which we were not to use. You wanted to talk proper English, Oxford, Cambridge, London English, not necessarily with an Oxford, Cambridge or London accent. You wanted to keep your Scottish voice, your Scottish pronunciation, but using Scots words or using Scots grammar, that was something that you didn't want to do. Feeling embarrassed to speak Scots was a consequence of choosing English as the language of the intellect and the wider world. People associate Scots with childhood, with nostalgia, uh, with a kind of look back, looking back to kind of a rosy-hued time. And so they begin to associate Scots with sentiment and uh, English with schooling, with education, with advancement. So you get this bifurcation, if you like. Scottish intellectuals queued to write the obituary of Scots, among them James Boswell, who mourned its passing. The Scottish language is being lost every day and in a short time will become quite unintelligible. In some ways, Scots never recovered from the blows dealt to it during the Enlightenment. Yet, despite this mauling, it's still alive. Why? Because ordinary folk never stop speaking it. Old Reeky, thou at the canty hole, a beeld for money, cold drift soul, wha snugly at thine ingle, low, baith warm and couth, while rune they gar the beaker roll, to weep their mouth. Robert Ferguson, who penned these lines, died in an Edinburgh asylum at the age of just 23, but his contribution was enough to keep Scott's poetry alive. Ferguson's earlier verses, written when he was a student in St Andrews, are limp and pale imitations of what was being written in English at the time. And it's only when he began to write in Scots that Ferguson found his true voice. It's easy to think that Ferguson uses Scots when he wants to show you the unpleasant smells of old Reeky or, or talk about the farmer's ingle in a kind of sentimental, bucolic way. But Ferguson was more ambitious than that. And there's a great example when Ferguson does translate Horace, a famous ode in Horace, when Horace is essentially taking the idea of seize the day, get on with it. And the Scots is just fantastic. He says, ne'er fash your fum what God's decree to be the weird, the fate of you or me. Um, and the poem concludes, the day looks gash, the day looks bright, toot off your horn, nor care ye stray about the morn. Don't give a straw what's going to happen the next day. And He's showing that Scots is fantastic for that. It's eloquent, it's lively, it's funny, it's feisty, but it can reach to that kind of higher idiom. Ferguson's passion for the language sits uneasily with more conservative views expressed by Church of Scotland ministers in the statistical account and early social census. The Buchan dialect has long been famous for the want of that neatness of articulation by which the southern and more cultivated nations have characterized their respective languages. 
In this corner, we retain all the vulgarity of idiom, metaphor and accent, which is to be met with in any part of the world. I doubt if the minister's congregation would have cared our muckle for this view of their language. Scots was in their blood. They lived it, they loved it, they spoke and sang it with every breath, which is why we have such a rich musical heritage today. So red roses, my love and I sat and he stayed out his fiddle, but he played his love at tune in the middle. For generations, the custodians of this oral tradition were the travelling people of Scotland. They kept the language alive in their songs and stories. Our um, aunties and uncles and old relatives, our son, they felt there was an importance in, in this oral tradition. They said the ballads are in the ear and you breathe them in and you let it fall upon your breastbone because that's where your resonation is. And when it's there, you use your heart and your spirit to take it out. And so it's like, it's like a sort of a, a free feeling. And like nature, you listen to the different sigh and the winds going through the trees. The hills are clad in purple and the leaves are clad in gold. It's that special wildness in your ballad. That special part for Nesmore nature is accompanying your ballad. And that's that very special thing which the maize comes into. The maize being the corruption of the muse. And when the muse is there present, you'll get the shivers doing your spine. Ah, he's bearsted through and through his bonny lassie's hair. The first song I was ever learned was for twa, twa bothy lads on the farm uh, side Meagle of Arbor. My father was gaffer and uh, I was forever in and out the bothy as a, as a wee fellow year old and they used to stand me on, the, on their, their kist, uh, their meal, mealer is the correct way, and on the kist and uh, they learned me Loch Lomond. My old granny, God bless her, my mum's mum, she used to sing me the, the Ben of Hees on a bumby stung me wheel above the knee. Uh, I, I love the dialect as well. I think the, my father come from the Buchan area, and I just think that the, the songs have got a, you know, the, the words seem to sort of ring through to my ears. This is our life. These songs are our are, are way of life. And we do share songs. We sing when, when we haven't got a festival, we sing down the phone to each other, the yellows <laughs> on the broom, in the hope that it'll soon be there and we'll be on the road again. The folk tradition runs deep in Scotland. It may have been ignored and betrayed by Enlightenment Edinburgh, but it informed and inspired the poet of the age, Robert Burns. For centuries, we have viewed Robert Burns as the heaven-taught ploughman. In fact, his teachers were the ordinary folk who carried the nation's songs, and Burns was quite happy to borrow from them. Jamie, come try me, Jamie, come try me. If thou would be my love, Jamie, if thou would kiss me, love, what could deny thee? Well, in a lot of Burns' letters, we know that he, he actually listened to people singing. His very first poem was actually a song, Once I Loved a Bonnie Lass. Burns says in one of his letters that he, he poured over collections of songs, and they were English songs as well as Scottish songs, and everything that came into print that he could get his hands on, he went through. So a number of his things, a number of his ideas, his images, um, his little refrains came from the folk tradition, from an oral tradition, or they came from a published tradition. If thou would be my love. Burns is celebrated for fusing muscular Scots with humanitarian themes, and his faith and honest use of our language not only helped to preserve Scots, but also brought him a truly worldwide audience. His greatest truthfulness came when he used his own tongue. That, that's where he could be wholly a Scotsman writing with Scots folk. And the more particular you are when you write, in other words, the more parochial you are, the more universal you are, because 
is he, is he real kin? You know, all folk are the same under the skin. Burns stood up heroically to the anglicising tide that was sweeping Scotland, but no one could halt the tremendous social changes that would overtake the nation in the next hundred years. Burns's rural Scotland was about to be changed forever. Industrialisation and the Highland clearances led to massive migration. There stands a pair, the wheel above that is nae turning. In 1750, 90% of Scots lived off the land, but just a century later, half the population lived in Glasgow and its surrounding industrial towns. Social upheaval would affect the language. The working class dialects in the central belt had some relationship to the lowland languages that has been spoken almost from time immemorial. But then it would be given the new thrust, industrial revolution, uh, there was less uh, fancifulness about the language, there was more directness, and I suppose all these things happened, and th so the language would become modified. This urban Scots was associated with heavy industry and poverty. To anglicised ears, it was the language of the gutter. We had two languages we spoke. There was a language we spoke at home and uh, on the streets. And then when we went into school, school age, uh, quite frankly, you were forbidden to speak in that language. They belted you if you used the Scots word. If you were asked a question and you said, aye, you got the belt. So you very quickly learned not to say anything until you'd learned some of these new English words. Um, but it was a double-edged sword because once you'd learned English in the school, when you were speaking to your parents in the house, if you used English, they would scalp you as well because you were being uppity or smart. So as a way you didn't ken which language you were to use at what time, it had this wonderful effect of just shutting us up. But Scots wouldn't remain silent for long. When the working class began to speak out, the words they used were Scots words, and they had the anglicised Scottish elite quaking in their boots. Right enough. My language is disgraceful. Just about every book I own. Tell me. Even the introduction to the Scottish National Dictionary. Tell me. Ah well. All living language is sacred. Fuck the lot of them. The shared experience of hundreds of thousands of working class Scots honed and politicised the language. There was a bluntness, there was a directness, there was a cockiness, there was a self-assuredness, there was a solidarity. And, and it, all, it all added together to quite a formidable a set of ideas and a, a kind of culture that all, all was there to express not only the realities but the aspirations. These aspirations would be fought for. Scots, once the language of kings, would become a weapon of class warfare. For 300 years, the Scottish ruling class did everything in its power to bludgeon the language into submission. But Scots would not be easily beaten. Stripped of its place in Scottish institutions, it remained the language of the people. And Carl McDougall returns next Tuesday at the same time and reveals how the Scots language adapted to the demands of the modern world. Next on BBC Two Scotland, it's Newsnight and Newsnight Scotland.